Hello. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I won't be cooking for any of you, I'm sorry, but we'll talk about that later. Um, so most of you don't know me, so I figured the best way to introduce myself would be to share a very embarrassing picture. This is me at age seven, um, growing up in Beirut, Lebanon. And this was on Halloween, and I was dressed as Jasmine, one of my favorite Disney characters. And looking back now, this is a very ironic picture to me. Uh, because there I am, a seven-year-old girl growing up in Beirut, celebrating a quintessential American holiday, Halloween, which is still my favorite. And I'm dressed up as the ultimate Western stereotype of my own culture. Jasmine, an exotic Arabian princess from a land far, far away. And this isn't that big of a deal. I was young, Jasmine was cool. But what it signifies is actually really important. In our increasingly connected world, cultural boundaries are being eroded, both metaphorically and physically. And it's becoming a lot harder for us to define who we are. The term third culture kid used to mean somebody who was raised in a place besides the, the hometown, hometown of their parents. But with the digital age, it's much more possible for you to experience other people's cultures uh, and, and feel like you belong to their culture that might not be the culture that you were born into. When I was growing up, I thought that everything that came from the West was cool and exciting and fun, and everything that was local was outdated and old. And um, my cousins, who used to live in the US, used to visit, and we had a word for things that were too traditional. We would call them arabic -y. We'd say, oh, that guy's accent is so arabic -y. or uh, you know, that song is way too arabic -y. And, you know, that's funny now, um, but with time, of course, I realized that this arabic or cultural heritage is actually a vital part of who I am and who we are. And if we don't uh, start to protect it, it's going to get lost along the way. So the question is, how do we preserve cultural heritage? And this is a question that I've asked myself um, throughout uh, my work as a designer. And uh, you, the, the, the real question is, what are the different ways that we, we preserve, we as humans preserve cultural heritage? And there are lots of different ways. So sometimes we use restoration. So we take something old, we fix it, we maintain it, we make sure that it looks exactly the way that it always looked. Sometimes we conserve something, so we make it grand, we make it, uh, we make it, we celebrate its significance, we invite people to look at it. Sometimes we commemorate, so we put something in a glass case for people to see, or we tell a story to our grandchildren. Uh, the idea is that we freeze an idea in time, and we hope that that will preserve it um, in the future. And then, uh, in contrast, we adapt. So we take something that's old, and we adapt it to the present. So we think about how can this thing live on, uh, how can it stand the test of time? And um, with adaptation, this is uh, one of the most controversial methods of preservation. And a lot of people are against it because they associate adaptation with modernization. And they think that modernization means uh, losing the essence of the tradition. But I don't think that it's really that black and white. I think that it is a thin line, but it's not that easy to differentiate between the two. And in my work as a designer, um, I've explored the concept of adaptation through various methods and through various projects. So for example, in this one, I was exploring um, Arabic typography. And Arabic is such a beautiful, but a, a fairly stagnant language. And the idea here was, uh, this was during a typography workshop in Rome. I photographed signage, uh, Roman signage, and I uh, adapted it by imitating exactly the form and transliterating the words uh, in order to explore the idea of how do you merge two cultures together? What happens when you uh, apply a foreign format 
to Arabic typography, for example. Um, this one is about um, adaptation through recollection. So these are a series of fictional stories that I wrote um, that tell a, a, fic a story of a fictional relationship between two cities, New York and Beirut. And the idea here is to create something entirely new, so a book of fictional letters between cities from uh, histories in order to preserve histories of these two cities. And um, this is a more real world example. Uh, this is branding that I did for a Manushi place in New York. And in this case, um, adaptation is, uh, the form of adaptation is education. So um, keeping the name Manushi, uh, using Arabic lettering on the walls, uh, the mural at the bottom is a, a skyline intertwining the two cities. Um, the idea here is you educate the customer in the hopes of preserving a, cult a cultural aspect like food. So when somebody comes into the store, you're forcing them to ask the question, what is a manushe? Where does it come from? What is this thing on the wall? What does it say? Um, by the way, it says, tu tu ta Beirut. <laughs> Can't really see it here. Um, and then uh, branding. Uh, plays a large role in this. And in this case, this is my take on the miswak, an ancient Islamic toothbrush. And um, the idea here is that branding is actually really powerful. And I'm the founder of this toothbrush, or Hadha Miswak. And this toothbrush is a line of products that uh, revives the miswak and reintroduces it to the world. So a little bit of a backstory because the first question I always get is, how did you end up working on a project like this toothbrush? Um, believe it or not, I didn't wake up one morning and discover my life's mission to revive the miswak. I was in uh, grad school in New York and I uh, w was taking a product design class and I actually discovered the miswak on a Wikipedia page, sadly but it's a true story. And uh, from that, I was fascinated by it, and I couldn't believe that I had never heard of it before because it is a long-lost uh, long lost knowledge. And immediately, I wanted to do something with it. So I uh, created a, a brand, this toothbrush, and I created a product that would make it easy to carry and uh, cut and peel uh, the miswak on the go. And these are just mostly Photoshop work <laughs> that I did really, really quickly. And I also created uh, Subway ads because the idea was I'm marketing this to a Western audience. And I put it up on my online portfolio and kind of forgot about it. And it started to get some press. Um, people started writing about it. I started getting emails from people asking, where can I buy this? I saw a Subway ad, but I can't find it in the pharmacies. And of course, the whole thing was a concept. Um, so, I, after I graduated, I was still receiving these emails and I said, okay, I guess people want this thing. And I uh, created a uh, crowdfunding campaign to raise money for production. And thankfully, it was successful. And so this uh, started to turn, started to move from being a project, a sketch, into a real business. Um, and throughout my journey, I've learned a lot about how different elements of a brand can come together to revive something, a piece of, of cultural heritage. Um, so the four elements that I want to focus on today are story, aesthetic, function, and reach. So uh, the first one is story. And uh, the story of a brand is really important in communicating your message to your audience. Um, this toothbrush focuses on two stories, although the Maswak has many, many stories to tell. It focuses on two stories. So the challenge here was, how do you create one brand with two stories and two languages? Um, as you all might know, the Maswak is an Islamic tradition. It's considered Sunnah. Uh, in Islam. And a lot of people associate the miswak with something 
very old and that might not fit into their uh, modern uh, their modern everyday lives. Uh, I've spoken to a lot of people who say, oh yeah, my grandfather used to use that. Or yeah, we, I used to see that when I was uh, you know, a little kid. Where did you even find that? Um, and so the, the biggest challenge here was changing the perception of the Maswak through language, through visuals, through storytelling. Uh, so for example, using taglines like Qadimak Nadimak or Maswak Yaliq Bi Mustawak. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, we'll skip that one. Um, the second story is the miswak as a natural product. So a lot of people who use the miswak don't actually know the scientific side of it. And there are a lot of medicinal benefits to the miswak. So in this case, we're using language and science and facts to, to communicate a different story, which is that the miswak is a natural toothbrush. Um, it's good for you, it's good for the environment, it's good for your wallet. Um, next is aesthetic. So the first time somebody told me, lean your product looks like an Apple product, I panicked a little bit. And then I looked at it and I said, yeah, it does. It absolutely does. And this isn't surprising. Being part of the Apple generation, we're all inevitably influenced by this aesthetic. And uh, at the end of the day, this is what also uh, helps people relate to the product and it makes them feel like it can fit into their lifestyle. Of course, there were design elements um, that were incorporated that are, uh, that are specific to uh, the culture and the language, and I'll talk about this in a little bit. And this toothbrush isn't just about you know, pretty visuals um, and language, it's also about function. And uh, the cutter case, uh, which you've seen photos of, which is the first product um, that we're launching, is a, a, it's, a, it's a problem solver. So uh, it has four main functions, and it really helps you use the miswak and carry the miswak around with you and cut it and peel it. And a lot of problems that people have on a daily basis and the reason that they don't use it as often as they'd like to. And when I first started using a sock, I realized that it, it's for such a portable, uh, for such a portable object that doesn't need water or toothpaste, um, there there wasn't really a good way to do this. So the cutter case is designed to do all of these things. And when you create value for uh, for somebody, and when you create value for a customer, they uh, they they immediately relate to your brand and they immediately are encouraged to either try it out for the first time or, uh, or, try or use it to solve the problem that they're having. So it's solving a need. And um, finally, reach. So uh, it's, it, it's, it's really important, um, sorry, I totally forgot what this point was. <laughs> um, okay, so in social media, um, it's really easy to communicate with a large group of people nowadays. And we can use this to leverage something like a, a piece of cultural heritage. And the, the, the main way that we do this is, this is one of the biggest decisions I had to make early on, which was, do I make it an English brand? Do I make it an Arabic brand? Do I, make, do I separate it and make two brands? And from the beginning, I wanted to stick to a bilingual brand for everything, which made things a lot harder, but I think it's worth it. So even on the product itself, no matter where you get it in the world, it will have the Arabic uh, lettering as well as the English engraved into the cap. The packaging is bilingual, the website is bilingual. And the idea here is that whoever, whoever the project, product reaches, it's telling them, hey, I have a story and it's worth hearing and it's worth listening to. So this toothbrush is really about pride. It's really about sharing these ideas with the rest of the world, even though it's a specific, uh, specific to a culture. So in our part of the world, we're, uh, we're used to importing things and ideas. And we trust them. We think that just because you're importing something means that it's probably more credible, it's more trustworthy, 
it's, it's, it's something that I do all the time. And even ideas that are generated locally are often replicas of ideas that are found elsewhere. So I'd like to conclude with just this idea, which is if we just look within instead of outwards, we could find so much of our cultural heritage that can be relevant elsewhere, that can be celebrated by others. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that something that is of cultural heritage has to be preserved and put into a museum casing. Thank you. Any questions? Hey, Asela. Hi. Uh, great presentation. Hi. Thank you. I, I feel like I sped through it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really good. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned the Manushe uh, identity, and you decided to um, leave it as an Arabic word and write it in English. Why didn't you um, do this with your maswak, as in have a maswak? You could have written it in... Latin or English, yeah. or this is a maswak, for example, instead yeah, of toothbrush. Absolutely. absolutely. So there's a couple of reasons. One is just the, or, the organic nature of the project. It actually started with the English. So the brand started with this toothbrush. And the idea behind this toothbrush initially was, uh, I think I saw, uh, showed you some of the subway ads, was this is a toothbrush, this is a stick. And the idea was to connect to people with something they already know. So starting from really from scratch, saying this is a miswak, by the way, this is also a toothbrush, by the way, it's also a natural, that I felt like that was too many steps. So that, that's one. And the second thing is when, when I realized that, okay, I'm, you know, I, wanna, I wanna pursue this, and, uh, and I started looking into the Arabic branding, I actually debated about this a lot how do you translate something like this toothbrush into Arabic for a completely different market? And I went through a lot of different ideas. At some point, I thought, okay, should you transliterate this toothbrush so that it's actually this, the, seen? I'm really happy I didn't do that. It sounds so stupid now. Um, but at the end of the day, when, I, when we decided to go for Hadha Maswak, uh, the idea was to celebrate it. So it's saying Hadha Maswak. This is it, you know? Um, so it does carry different meanings. It's not a direct translation. How much is it sold for? Uh, so the cutter, <laughs> the cutter case that comes with two miswaks, and uh, that's 110 dirhams, so I'm not sure what that is in Kuwaiti. But we can talk later. <laughs> Come to me later, we'll talk. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Um, I want to tell you first, good job. Thank Keep you. going, that's amazing. Hadam Swag, this entrepreneur. Thank I just you. need to ask you something. When you market, let's say Man Oshe or Maswak or any other uh, product, there is different markets between Arab words and foreigners. So what, uh, how can I say? So when you market Maswak, you focus more on the functions of this product. And when you mar brand it for Arab words, you focus more about the heritage side and this one. Uh, can you, can you uh, switch between these two concepts if you do it uh, in reverse side? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question and also something that's, that's come up a lot. Uh, so the, from the beginning, it's always been very important to me uh, not to separate the two. So it's always been very important not to have he, those two stories that I talked about, those are always intertwined. So wh even when, you, when you're talking about uh, the miswak as it's from its natural form, its scientific form, there's always the origin aspect. And this has always been a little bit tricky because if you're selling something, for example, in the US, I would love to say, here's the full story of where this comes from. But unfortunately, in today's world, you have to be careful about how you market something. So if I go to the US and I say, hey guys, I have this Islamic product, do you want it? Likely, the answer is gonna be no. Unfortunately, it's, it's, that's the case. So, but at the same time, you also don't want to conceal the identity of it because that's, that's the essence of it. That's what preserving it is about. So it's about finding that balance. And 
I, it's a constant struggle, but I, I hope that you know it's it's doing a little bit of it. I I would um, ask the question of it's a natural product and you're uh, marking marketing it as a natural product. Why is the packaging not natural? Why is it pla put in plastic? Why is it not put in like they used to sell it in these um, paper bags or something much more biodegradable? Let's say. That's that's a really great question, and I actually I, I get that a lot. Um, actually, the cut so the cutter case that you saw uh, the the thing that has a cutter in the tube, that's made of a material called Eastman Triton, and I had never produced a product before, so this was all a big learning experience for me. But when I first started going to production and meeting with manufacturers and researching these things, I definitely wanted to find something that would make it. Uh, that would match the, the eco-friendly um, nuances that, that you're promoting. So I found this material, it's called Eastman Triton. It's not perfect, um, but it's, it's really great for uh, compared to others. So it's a copolyester, and it's BPA-free, it's, uh, it's estrogenic activity-free, and it's recyclable. So this is something that I want to continue to work on. Um, but I think it's it's a start. The reason that I didn't go for um, you were saying like the bundles and things like that is because the product itself needed to be so. For example, the Eastman Trident it's uh, dishwasher safe, so it makes it really easy to clean it because when you put the maswak inside, it can it can gather you know pieces of it. It can uh, get moist, and uh, so you can wash it really easily. The blades are stainless steel to avoid rusting, so there's also safety concerns there in terms of the function of the product. Um, the miswak itself, uh, we sell it vacuum sealed. This is something that's been a huge challenge to find eco, uh, to find a sustainable plastic that you can vacuum seal. It actually doesn't exist yet, which is crazy to me. There are a couple of companies working on it, um, but that's that's the one that's actually that annoys me more than the than the cutter because the cutter you buy once, and the the packaging of the cutter is, is recyclable. It's all made of paper. Um, but the, the vacuum sealing, that's the part that I'm working on because... One more. Yeah. Um, do you, would you consider having this um, very popular or used to be very popular accessible product more accessible and less expensive? F because at the end of the day, it is something that used to be used by, you know, anyone. Anyone could afford it. So, <coughs> and especially that, you know, you you keep on um, peeling it and yep. reusing it. So would you consider having it much more accessible to the people? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the miswak itself, the singles, uh, we're actually se selling them right now in Mecca. And we sell them for, for almost the same as ha how much you would buy another brand's uh, vacuum sealed packaging. So uh, the miswak is not much more expensive than how you'd find it. It's really high quality, that's what we guarantee. It's hand-picked. Hand we work really closely with the suppliers on the quality of the miswak and the way that it's preserved. So, uh, yeah, absolutely, it should be accessible. It depends on the product. Thank you. Um, have you gone into production in the US fully, or are you still in the process? And if so, would you require FDA approval? And uh, and And, one last thing, um, do you think there might be hesitation um, on the part of anyone trying to, to market it or, or distribute it if they know it's Islamic based? You know? Yeah, um, so actually we moved operations, well, we started operations in Dubai um, about five months ago. So now the company is based in Dubai um, right now, I'm focusing on uh, the region before the U.S., um, but there is a lot of interest in places like the U.S. and Europe. And in the U.S., we actually are doing some testing on the ground, like giving it out, seeing what people think, that sort of thing. Uh, FDA-wise, uh, there's no real answer there. Uh, people will tell you different things. So still doing the research, still figuring it out. There's a lot of specificities, of course, about legal, so what you write on the package. You can't say things like, better than a toothbrush, you know, or like, you know, forget your toothbrush, this is, you know, this is the next big thing, or 
a whitened teeth or fights oral cancer, any of these things that are actually, there are scientific studies that show that it does, but it's very hard to put those things on a label. So for the US market, you have to think about those a little bit more. In terms of the Islamic point, it's definitely something um, that I'm very conscious of. Uh, but at the same time, like I mentioned earlier, I don't want to lose that side of it because I think that's, it's a great opportunity to change people's perceptions um, of things that are associated with Islam. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a great rep, especially in places like the US. So uh, it, it's, it's all about, for me, it's more about the language, what kind of language you use, what kind of visuals, how do you position it. Uh, it's definitely a challenge. Great. Thank you, Lean, very much. Thank you. Big hand for you.